Man, trying to do this whole business planning during coronavirus. Every year. Yeah. Gotta get a vibe board. I know. Out. We're getting better at this. Hold on, people are coming into the studio. It's time. Chuck Pokey? Oh my God! It's Friday. Why do we have Chuck Pokey? I'm here to see John Die, man. I'm glad you guys are here. This is fantastic. That's in, man. Last time I saw you was the American Contractor Summit. Oh man, it was a good time. Get in here. Social distance. We need an autograph. Here. Look, this is it's the same vibe we used. Man, listen, we were given this. Eric's gonna present this to the. Hi, Before yeah. you leave, can you sign an autograph for our wives, please? Oh, Your favorite. Yeah. Man. Come on. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, here we are live. Yeah, yeah. It's Corinne. C O R I N N E. Thank you. Oh, look at that. That's Corinne. Get a oh. shot of that. The Toki, right we there. Go. There we go. Bonafide. For my wife. Becca. Bonafide. Right. Becca, it's Becca. She thinks you're famous. I told her, thank. This is the most famous man in contracting. He's the best retail sales coach that has ever lived. This is even amazing. a smiley face. Come on. This is an investment. <laughs> this is an investment. Let's get one for Priscilla Die too. She loves you. Chris works so hard. There's no way she's getting off without a Chuck Toki autograph. There. Got to go with the love. Oh, I like the it. Toki. Oh gosh. This guy's done this before. Boom. Good job. Right. Boom. We don't get to see Chuck as much because of coronavirus, yeah. but. Anytime we get a legend in our office, we want That's autographs. Right. Hey, I'm glad to see you guys. The check's in the mail, buddy. The check's in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Chuck Doki, everyone. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Chuck Doki, dude, I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm, for, I'm pumped, man. Thanks, thanks for having me out here. No, dude, thank you for coming by and for uh, spending a little time in the studio with us to share your knowledge because, you know, you were one of the best speakers at the summit by far. Thank you. I mean, I, I've gotten a lot of messages. People were just like, man, that, that talk Chuck did was fire. And it was, dude. Like, I mean, that was amazing. For those of you guys that didn't catch the summit, Sam will have to put the link here in the in the description here for this because that that talk alone was worth millions of dollars in the right hands. Yeah, I had a lot of text messages and phone <laughs> calls and emails on the way home. I had a two-hour drive home, and it made it into like 15 minutes, it seemed like. So... <laughs> Well, dude, I think it's because you have this, you have the, the, the gift that you have in this, in the unique perspective that you have. Um, I always tell people Chuck's one of the smartest guys I know in the industry by far, because you. you definitely have a unique perspective that. and, and going into 2021 now, I know today we want to talk about sales leadership and not just sales in general, but leadership, how to build a team, what you should be doing culturally right. just as a company to attract more sales reps, right? Because that's what everyone wants. That's exactly right. Probably one of the toughest things for companies right now is how to attract sales reps. I've seen so many, uh, and I, I know so many contractors right now that are solopreneurs and um, are trying, or maybe it's just them and a guy or two that they hired, and they're just like, man, why, what am I doing wrong that these other companies are doing right to grow these teams to 15, 16, 17, 20, 30, 40 sales reps? And they just don't understand what it is and so i'd love to get your perspective on that and talk a little bit about leadership in general when it comes to managing sales reps because it's not the same as managing subs or jobs yeah. or anything else it's totally you know, different i'll tell you when it comes to sales leadership here's the biggest issue that i find is that companies will take their top performer and i think that that guy is going to be their their the best sales leader and it's not they have to understand what a good sales leader is first of all you know, when I first got into sales and, uh, you know, I was very good at it. I, I liked it, uh, made a ton of money. Right. And <laughs> but what drove me was the other people that I worked with. And at that time I was in mortgage and, you know, everybody was asking me, how are you doing this? How are you getting so many? Uh, I mean, I had I had uh, uh, what is that? Wells Fargo shoveling me a client. I couldn't get them fast enough. I was hiring people to, to take the phone calls. And so I had more fun working with the other people, helping them understand how that worked. And so then but, I, but that's decided, an anomaly though. That's not normal. Like really good sales reps typically aren't out there building other sales reps. No, usually they'll hide from them. Yeah. They're, they're trying to, they, they have like what they think is a secret sauce and, and honestly they're too they busy making it. sales. Yeah. I mean, if you're a good sales rep, you're spending all your time 
making sales. Like you don't have time to be training other people. Right. And it was that first sales rep that, you know, she was, it was a, she, and so she was struggling and she was actually talking about moving on. She was going to go be somebody's <laughs> admin, you know, and she says, you know, Chuck, what is it? What is it that you're doing? And so I kind of took her under my wing when in the time that I had and she grew. That's and cool. the money that she's that she made and the money she's making now, she's still in mortgage and the, the insane amount of money she's making now, that does something to <laughs> me. And it should do, do something to every sales manager out there. And if it doesn't, they don't belong in sales management. But I realized that that is what made me happy. It wasn't all the money. It was the fact that I could take somebody that, you know, they never thought they could make that kind of money and to bring them into it. Uh, mm -hmm. Another story is I was getting uh, uh, my truck washed, and this was a, a few years back, but I was getting my truck washed. So I don't think your truck could fit through a car wash. No, your they have to hand wash that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy was drying it off, and he did, was, I mean, he was amazing with what he was doing. It wasn't this, this it just drying it off. I mean, he was very meticulous. So I went up to him. I asked him, I says, what's your role here? He says, I actually manage the car wash. I says, do you like what you do? And he says, well... I mean, I, I like the fact that everybody kind of leaves me alone. I says, do you like the money you make? He goes, no, not really. I says, I bet you make, what, 30, 35,000? He says, on a good year. I says, do you feel like you're worth 100,000? And he goes, man, that would be great. He says, I, I'm, a, I'm a Marine, you know, and, and I just started this position. You know, I've been doing this, you know, to, and trying to build this team. And I says, hey, man, I, I, let me ask you, you know, it's mine, uh, the uh, – let me ask you, I says, if I was able to teach you how to do what I do, how to sell like I sell, and how to make six figures, is that something you'd be interested in? Today, he's making a quarter million dollars a year. <laughs> he's living in the, the hills of, of uh, Georgia. I mean, it's just amazing to watch, and that's what drives me. I make a great income. There's no doubt about it, but it, what it, that is not what drives me. It's the people that, it's kind of like what Hunter says, it's the legacy. Right. You know, it's the people that send you that letter 10 years down the road that say, you're the one that changed my life. And that's why I do it. And that's why other sales managers should do what they do. If you feel that you can help somebody, you should be a sales manager. Now, that's not the only thing. I mean, you have to know what you're doing. You have to be able to train people. You have to be able to hold people accountable. But you also have to be able to believe in them. And sometimes some of these people are hard to believe in. But, <laughs> you know, and I'm a great guy. He's one of the, the, the top salespeople at LA Fitness. But he comes in and he, I thought, man, he's going to come out of these gates. He's, he's going to be the best. And he stalled. He, he wasn't as good as I thought thought he was but he has that charisma and I believed in him I kept telling him I believed in him now I was giving him some tough love you know right when he says man I just don't know why I'm not you know taken off and I'd throw the closing roadmap in and I says can you literally give me that closing roadmap if I asked you that your price is way too much that man you must really you know you must really love that product is that product you I mean for whatever reason that's just way more than what I can spend <laughs> I said can you honestly give me the answer right now and he said no I says there's your problem. I says, I believe in you, but I'm waiting for you to believe in you. And so at this point, he just had his first $100,000 month for, for a retail company, oh, wow. for a new guy, and he just sold his first month of $100,000 in sales. I couldn't be more proud of him. Yeah. I mean, and for a sales manager to shed a tear to say, I knew you could do it, man. And now we're not going to look back. It's like when the, the first time a sales rep they they make their first six figure year right i says you don't understand this right now i says but you're in the hundred thousand dollar club and let me explain to you what a hundred thousand dollar club is before you got to this hundred thousand dollars you didn't know what a hundred thousand dollars looked like you didn't know that you could go anywhere in, in the country and make this kind of money but once you hit that hundred thousand dollars it's like a new door has opened up to you a new networking group has just opened up to you and now these blinders are off and all these opportunities, you just look around and all these opportunities are for $100,000 or more. Now, and when you hit that $200,000, you are in the $200,000 club that people are just throwing positions at you. you mm -hmm. know? But once you get there, 
you know, you, you didn't know that was possible until you got there. It's the four minute mile. And that's what we, a good mm -hmm. sales manager can help their people to understand. You can't be selfish. You know, when my sales reps leave, because they, maybe they see an, another opportunity, maybe they just have to try something out. I say, hey man, if you wanna come back, the job is here, the first time. Now you leave me a second time, you're done, but <laughs> you know, you first time, hey, that's, you know, this is your first sales job, you have to go out, you have to see what else is out there. It happens, but you know, I, I've, even the people that I have let go, I mean, I'm still great friends with. Yeah, well I've noticed that, because a lot of your former colleagues at some of your old companies have always stepped into uh comment on videos and talk yeah. about stuff being i love working with chuck and so i hear that a lot from a lot of people and that's a huge testament though most sales managers don't get that right most of the time it's yeah you know it, it's never like they leave on good terms especially not in our industry when people right. leave companies it's usually because they got screwed over money wise or something happened and then they're looking for a new opportunity and it but all those type of problems usually stem from bad leadership. It does, it does. And when you look at bad leadership, when you look at leaders that are all in it for them and they see that their salespeople are nothing but tools yeah. in, the, in the company, I see them as athletes. I see my team as the corporate athletes and, I, and they all know this. Mm -hmm. You know, they all know that I love them and in, even the ones that I've had to um, let go. And I don't like saying let go. I, I like to what let them do, what know. What do you that. mean by athletes? Like explain that a little bit further. So these are the people that, you know, they, when you look at the athletes, when you look at, um, you know, people, these people run, they, they're, everything is based on performance and results. And so to me, that's an athlete. You know, you look at, you know, the GOAT, Tom Brady, you know, it's funny. <laughs> I hated him when he was with the Patriots. All of a sudden he's with, you know. but uh, it's these people, they're responsible for results, just like athletes. So I say these are corporate athletes. Many of them hate to work out, so they're not oh, yeah. true athletes. But, you know, that's why um, they are as good as they are, you know, especially in our business with home improvement, because it's a quarter mile. We run quarter miles all day, every day, every month. It's not like the corporate sales where it's a journey. You know, I'm gonna take this guy for six months mm -hmm. and, and hopefully I can land this, you know, large multi-million dollar project. In our business, it's a quarter mile. It's, it's 10,000 or $20,000 at a time. And, and we do that several times a day. Right. That's, that's what you mean by quarter mile. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not the same as, uh, where you have an account that you're managing that is constantly feeding you right. sales. These are, yeah, one and done sales transactions that are a little bit shorter, shorter uh, lifespan wise. Right. So the sales cycle is different for sure. And that's, and that creates a unique challenge, I think though, for sales reps. That's why you have to choose the right ones. You really have to choose the right sales reps. Uh, there's so many different ways of finding the right sales reps. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm in a large mastermind and, and, you know, I, I like the disc tests. Um, I won't hire and fire based on them, the but it tells test. you a lot. Disc, um, it's a personality profile. Okay. So, um, like the D is, is a, you know, if they have a high D, that means that they're very dominant. Okay. You know, they don't like to hear the word. No, they got some ego. Now there has to be a balance here. Um, so a high I. These are people that love to have fun. You know, they're typically salespeople, have very high eyes. Uh, an S is submissive. You know, they are, if you know, they can, they go along to get along type people. And then you have your C, these are your very, uh, your accountants, they're, they're your thinkers. Right. You know, I, I like the platinum rule where, I mean, it's your directors, your socializers, your relators, and your thinkers. To me, that makes more sense. But inside of DISC, which is more widely known, you want to find people with a high D, high I, which means that they're very, uh, they don't like to hear the word no, they've got a decent ego, and that high I means they're fun. You know, if they have a, a high D and high C, uh, they're just... And typically they're, they're a very organized asshole, you know, which, yeah, exactly. These are some of the most difficult people to manage. Yeah. In all reality, they're right? They can be. Yeah. 
how how do you guys go about though then managing people like that because i think that's the biggest problem that a lot of owners have or managers have is they're not true leaders or managers so they struggle yeah having to develop themselves to be able to manage people like that and ultimately they get frustrated and let them go because you know i'll tell you i you have to bring in your sales team to meet the culture and the sales manager typically sets that culture it's funny how people think that the owner sets the culture huh the sales manager sets that culture that's why it's so important to choose the right sales manager uh, but that you have to have a team and when any time a sales manager comes in i say hey it's draft day you have to draft your team. Don't come in blaming everything that goes wrong on the team that you inherited. You're not the president of the United States. You know, you can't come <laughs> in and say, I inherited this problem. No, you need to, your team, you need, it's, it's draft day. You need to draft your players. And so, you know, when, uh, anytime I come into an organization, I set the standard. I say, Hey, well, let's say you're is- drafting on the owners. Like, well, you can let this person go, but you got to keep him because mm-hmm. I've had it. How do you deal with that? A uh, very quick story. And this was back in Bathfitter. Um, the uh, the owner, it was when I first got into Bathfitter, it was kind of the friends and family plan. <laughs> You're either friends or family of the owner. And uh, when Which I got, is what most roofing companies are, right? I'll tell you, that's what happens a lot of times. Yeah. And so I would let certain guys go, but the only way I could let them go is when the owner went on vacation. <laughs> And uh, he got to the point, his name's Jason, he got to the point, he says, I'm never taking vacation again. Every time I take <laughs> vacation, I get all these phone calls that Chuck just let me go. <laughs> uh, but uh, it, uh, the team that, that I built there is still there. And that was nine years ago, eight, nine years ago. Uh, but it's, again, it's draft day. You have to find out who is on your team. Now, there may be people on that team that you're on the fence with mm-hmm. um, coming into Abel. There's a couple of guys that I was very on the fence. They didn't really buy into what, where I was going and what I needed to do, but we got along. And, but eventually it got to the point where I had to let them go be successful someplace else. And I'm still very close to them. And two of them are, own their own business now. Wow. You know, it's, they, they do things the way they want to do it. And I'm glad that they started their own business. Which Abel, if, for those of you guys that are watching, Abel's a beast. Yeah, that's a hundred and eighty million a year company for yeah. our space, and on the residential side, they're by far the largest. And you know, I lived in Columbus, so I I definitely know who Abel is. I've seen their planes flying over the Buckeyes games and all that good stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, they're 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 a monster. They and are it, managing a team like that is a whole different world, though. But let's talk about managing a small team, though. Yes, small teams, which now you do a lot of small team management I, and building. A lot. That's a whole. That's different, dude. Like that's, that's not for the week. I got to tell you, when I first got out of ABLE, I had, I was very arrogant. You know, I <laughs> thought that, I mean, we're the largest, you can't teach me anything. And what I found is a lot of the smaller teams have better technology, a better leadership, better. I mean, it's just, you know, better systems than these larger organizations. You got to realize well, it's like that a large are, ship versus a small ship. Yeah. They can't turn, yeah. you know, as fast. Um, they have to go through a lot of red tape. They're a very corporate run. Yeah. So in home improvement, that's very tough. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. why there's not a whole lot of them. Yeah. It's very difficult to get to that level. It is very, very difficult. Typically, um, they're, they get bought up very quickly mm-hmm. uh, through investors, which, you know, Abel and Mr. Roop did by a great investor, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the Crane Group. But, uh, you know, when you're looking at the small companies, when you're managing uh, a small team, I, I want everybody to realize that when you are small, you want to know where you're going. And if that, if where you're going, if is 50, 60, 70 million, if that's your end game, what I want you to realize is this is going to change. Mm-hmm. Your culture has to change. If it's one of these things where you, I just want everybody to love their job <laughs> at $20 million, things, the paradigm has to shift if you're going to keep going or else it will be mass chaos. Hmm. You know, we always want everybody to love their job, but everybody will start to understand that it's very scripted, very disciplined. It has to be to keep the chaos down at that level. When you're looking at uh, like the Richmond brothers, um, you know, you have uh, matrix basement systems and then you have uh, mad city windows they understood where they wanted to go 
and it's very, very disciplined. You know, it's both brothers are, are on two opposite sides of, of the personality scale. You know, Nate is very business oriented and Nick is he's fun. Yeah. You know, I love both of them. And, you know, but their their organizations didn't get to 60 million dollars as quickly as they did by saying, hey, we're going to build a family culture. You know, even though inside of there, everybody loves their job. They make great money. Even the sales reps, the, the admins, everybody makes great money. But it's very regimented, very disciplined. And that's the only way. And they knew that that was the only way they could get there. But as a small company, you know, you have to run it like a small company. You can't be so regimented when you only have three guys. And half the time, if you have just three guys, those sales guys tend to run the company because like, I can't I can't lose them. Right. You know, the tail it tends to wag the dog, which is a scary place to be. Yeah. And so how important is it then to hire more people and to keep that team growing? Like how deep should they go? How quickly should they be hiring? So depending on if you're W2, 1099, how you pay, um, if you get the if you happen to be 1099 and they're straight commission, you have a little bit more freedom. You know, we can do a thing called flood the floor and sales guys hate to hear this. <laughs> you know, we almost need to change the name because it's got a bad rap. But we you know, you, you flood the floor, meaning you bring in a bunch of, of sales reps and you decide or you gonna, you're going to find out who's the cream of the crop because they're going to not. I, it's, it sounds bad when you say they're going to fight it out, but you're going to find out who's more disciplined, who's you know going to go after the, the business uh, faster. Who's going to have more on the profit side? You know, who gives it away in the house? You know, you have to find this out. Don't just take a look at, oh, man, he sold uh, $2 million last year. Yeah, he may have sold $2 million, but his profit was half of the guy that, you know, sold $1.5, and he's not getting any play. But the guy that sold $1.5 may be at 40% profit margin, right. gross profit. And the guy that $2 million, you know, the way that he got there was that he was the puppy dog in the house <laughs> and he's he's swimming around at 20 percent. Right. And he's giving away deals essentially right. to get to that number. That's that's a unique that's that requires though so much data in really keeping track of it and building yeah. those systems really early on for sales systems, at least, yeah. which, you know, for most companies, the owners are the, are the ones that are building those systems and doing all that. So do you start with a good sales team or do you start with a sales manager? So you have to bring in your salespeople. You do. I mean, if you start out with a sales manager, that's not bad if you know one. Right. Um, and uh, if he comes aboard, he starts selling, he starts building his team. Um, I'm not big on working managers. You know, everywhere I go, I, uh, even when I leave, I let them know that if you decide that you're going to have a manager and they're going to sell too, just understand that that is not, it doesn't build good trust. However, a small company, they don't have a choice. Right. You know, you can't pay a, a sales manager one hundred thousand dollars to come in. and He doesn't even have a team yet. So he's going to have to sell. He's going to have to build his team while he sells. And once he gets to eight people, he should be able to manage and not have to be able to produce. Now, I know a lot of you out there are in disagreements to this, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, you have a manager that works as well. He's going to be half as effective. That's that's a good that's a really good perspective, though. And it's part of the whole growing process. You know, putting all these pieces into place is, is not easy. And yeah. the culture, maintaining that culture is tough too. Because, you know, at the end of the day, business is business. Like people have to make decisions based on the health of the business. Right. And it's, you know, these companies like to all say, well, we're a big family here. This is a family thing. Like we're all, I mean, that's hard to say though. Yeah. Do, you, do you guys say that a lot in your in your organizations? We do. Um, it takes on a different meaning, though. I mean, when we say we're family, I mean, we all just we get along. We like each other uh, at American WeatherTech. When I came in, it's one of the, the few companies that I've come into where there's no backbiting. The, the sales reps truly do help each other out. They love each other. They and, but however, they also know the underperformers. And they're going to help them out until they decide that they don't want to get better anymore. And then people kind of, you know, they start to move away from them. Uh, but when you when we look at, hey, we're family, uh, we, we don't look at it as, you know, true family. 
You know, we look at it as a business family. We love yeah. each other. We'll help each other out. We don't want anybody to fail. And you said, though, they're, they're all getting along really well. They're helping each other out. But how many sales reps are there right now? We've got in that um, we're 14. No, we're probably 12. We have 12 right now. At what point do you start to lose a lot of that culture of as you grow? Well, and what do you do then? Is the, it more team oriented then, you think? That culture right there and the culture of helping each other out, we hope never leaves. Yeah. You know, we hope that never leaves. And uh, we don't allow the grenade walls, which you're going to have a few here and there. And we have to tackle those when they come. Um, as well as, you know, when you bring in a rehash, we're bringing in a rehash program right now. And we're trying to keep the sales guys at bay, but these guys aren't used to having a rehash. What's a rehash? So rehash means you're going to go out, you're going to uh, run a sales call. Now, these are our sales calls. These are leads that have come in. And you get one shot at it. And once that you... Once you have run that and you didn't sell it, then it goes to a rehash team. So uh, three days after that, that lead is run, we're going to call. We're going to do a survey. We're going to get that customer talking. We don't just start selling them right then and there. We're going to go through a whole survey process of, so, you know, did we show up on time? Did, uh, did he show you the, uh, the samples? We're going to go through every piece of that sale. And at the very end, one of the last questions we're going to ask him is, so if you don't mind me asking, what, what was it that made you decide not to move forward? And they might say, well, we've got some other people coming out. That price was a little bit higher than what we thought. Say, hey, what we'd like to do, we have a senior rep in that area this week. I'd like to get another set of eyes on this. Is it possible that he could just stop by, take a look at it, see if there's something he can do to help you out? We will never talk about discounts. We're not, uh, we don't want to discount it. Yeah. Where so many other rehash programs are, we had some product fall off the back of a truck. We, <laughs> you know, or we need to, f that's the worst is we need to fill. We have a truck right now. We need to <laughs> fill it. We need to get, and I cannot stand when you're going to sit there and lie to a, a homeowner just to try to get back in the door. Right. You know, we do want to get another set It cheapens set of everything at that point. It really does. <laughs> and and with social media, it, it comes full circle. Yeah. And, uh, well, I mean, imagine on. it too, like from just a consumer perspective. Yeah. I mean, if, if I bought in the first sale and then I get the email that says, well, you could have saved 40% or I find out that someone else got that email for saying no to the first deal. Right. I'd be ticked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just straight up. Right. And... So we look at it. What we have found is when we put the same rep back in the house, it doesn't sell. Right. It, it's, it's almost worthless to put the same rep back in the house because he's just going to continue from where he left off. But if I take somebody that is a different personality, so maybe the first one is a top rep, maybe he's all business. Mm -hmm. And then the second rep, so I'm going to look at um, a guy that uh, is a big teddy bear in the house. He's very good at selling. Maybe he's not the best one call closer, but it's a different personality. <laughs> and so I'm going to put him in next. And what we've found is about 80, well, 70, 80% of the time it closes <laughs> because it's the second time around. It's we're back in the house. They wouldn't have us back. So you in have there. a polar opposite. Yeah. Why would I put the same? Yeah. I'm not going to put, not only am I not going to put the same guy in, I'm not going to put the same type of guy in there. That's crazy. Yeah. Now That's some deep stuff. There will be a time where we just have one guy that does all rehash. Right. You know? And so, you know, that, that is where you typically want to go. Well, I almost feel like you could pair two salesmen up and just swap them back and forth. Yeah. Essentially. Right. Right. <laughs> that's such a that's a that's so uh next level like i've i've never heard contractors talk about that about rehashes or anything like anything like that but that's the kind of stuff that is revolutionary i think you know he, at least for us it is companies are losing millions of dollars and it sounds when you look at it like how could you be losing millions of dollars some of these companies and they're not big companies sell close to two million dollars a year in rehash that's missed sales that some other company that just happened to come in two weeks later uh and the customer is just sick and tired of listening to pitches i'll just go with them you, and, and my sales reps understand that their job isn't there to sell the homeowner their job is to save the homeowner from everybody else <laughs> we're not there to sell them 
We're there to save them. Because if you don't, John, if you join my, my team and the discussion that, that would be had in the beginning is that I want you to understand what your job truly is, is if you don't do your job, you don't do it exactly the way that I teach you. That means that some other company is going to come in. I'm not going to mention any of these companies. Uh, some of us already know who they are, but uh, some other company is going to come in. They're going to sell them a product for twice the amount for half the quality. Yeah. You know, this happens all yeah. the time in Windows. Yeah. Some of these very high priced companies sell just crap mm. Windows. Yep. Because they see the gross margin is their game. Mm -hmm. The customer's not their game, the gross margin is. And they, you know, they, they earn trust because of the number of commercials they run, how well known they are. Yep. Man, that's next level. So this is the kind of stuff you guys are getting ready for for this year right now. Yes. So you know, when we look at, and, and you mentioned hiring people, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the that's mode I'm in right now. Thing right now though. You know, I've got a, uh, I got a class going next week. And, uh, so right now is the time to hire some of my coaching clients, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, well, I think we're going to hire sometime in March and April, March and April. You should not be hiring people. <laughs> You, you, should you should be, be selling. You should be selling. Or training, getting ready to, yeah. I mean, that should be the time that, I mean, even the fact that I have a training class next week, I myself am kind of hitting myself a little bit like, hey, I'm way behind the eight ball, <laughs> you know, because I need to be getting ready for March. Yeah. March is when um, that's, if I don't have a huge March and a huge April, it really hurts my year. Well, you told me something when we were talking, we were talking about some, some other stuff a little, little bit ago, but you were talking about like the timelines for home improvement companies. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not spending money here, but they're spending money at this time. Why are they spending money in April and not in May? Like, what, what's the reasoning? Like, talk a little bit about that timeline, how, they, how most home improvements go through this cycle every year. So there is, uh, so throughout the, the uh, year, so January, so we just had a huge January. We blew our, our goal away, and I, um, I'm very superstitious, so I didn't say anything <laughs> to the guys until after January. And I told them, I said, guys, I couldn't be more proud of every one of you because I use this, and I've used it for 20 years. Great January, great year. Never seen it any other way. Right. You know, and then uh, when you get into February, this is when we get ready for the rest of the year. Do I have enough people? Do I, you know, are we trained? Uh, right now we are in full production training, meaning I'm not training production. Production is training my sales team. Because again, one of the worst things that can happen is the fact that we're out selling business that we can't produce. Oh yeah. Or sure. we mismeasure or whatever. So our production uh, managers are, are training our teams. But then we get into March, which is typically uh, your home shows. Right. Where you're, you're crushing your home show leads. Mm -hmm. There's home shows in January and February, some of them in March. This year, not so much. Right. Uh, and you know, if, if any sales manager that's worth their salt, it understands the the eight ball that they're behind because we don't have those shows. Typically, we can we can get a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars in business from each show. Well, we don't have any, right? So I have to figure out how I'm going to make that up because I don't have any shows this year, boss. You know, Mister Owner is not an excuse. So what are you guys doing differently? So we look at our lead flow. What type of lead flow do I need? What type of money do I need to ask for from the ownership of, you know, where we need to be within American weather techs. We're blessed to have some of some great owners. I mean, these guys really are on the ball uh, and they understand marketing. They understand sales. They understand production and where we need to go. And they're willing to invest the money. I mean, we went on TV uh, late last year you know, inside of a newer market because we knew what was going to happen this year. Yeah. You know, we plan, you know, great companies plan the next year in October. No kidding. Well, that's, and that makes sense. That's where it should be. And so, yeah, this is definitely like, you're like an ocean of knowledge. Man, I could sit here all day. How we much just, time do you got? <laughs> I, I know. We just get like this little drop. And every time you speak, like the summit, the and we were just talking about putting together a whole event around yeah. this kind of stuff. Um, and we'll we'll hopefully be announcing that at some point in, in the near future. But, man, just like every time we sit down, Chuck, like there's just so much great knowledge here that 
people need to get in, get get behind and, and start to really dig deep into it. But it's because there's there's a science behind this. Like there's actually proven strategies, and other industries are doing it. We're just now like really adapting to that. Our our industry has been so like running gun, like shotgun sales. Like let's just see what we can get. Yeah. What we don't, what we we just don't, and they're just taking the low hanging fruit, but getting deep into how retail sales work and even insurance uh, sales, like there's so much money being left on the table on insurance sales because we just don't understand or see the opportunity the right way. Right. We're seeing the opportunity for what we can make right here, right now, move on to the next job, make it as fast as possible, but we're leaving so much behind because of the lack of knowledge. And so having you on the show to help us is huge. And that's what, you know, we want to definitely provide to everybody. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, for sure. And you know, we'll, we'll have you back again and we'll keep these conversations going throughout the year because first off, you're right down the road, which makes it super easy, but you know, it's, it's so valuable, dude. Like everything you say, whenever we get around, I mean, I'm, you sold me a roof in Breckenridge last year, <laughs> just randomly. <laughs> like I was like, where do I pay for this? You come and show us your presentation and Hunter and I are both sitting there like, I, I need a credit card. <laughs> Do I need to call my <laughs> wife right now? Like what's going on? I don't even, I, I don't even know where I'm going to put this roof, but I need it. So no, dude, I really appreciate everything you do. And thanks so much for hanging out today. Thank you, man. Absolutely. Thanks so much for watching today's show. Make sure to like and subscribe our pages so that you can stay up to date with every episode. And by the way, this show is all about you, the American contractor. Be sure to comment let us know what you want to hear about and what subjects you want us to touch on. We'll be sure to include them in a future episode. Thanks again, and I hope you have a great day.